Well, hi, everyone. Today, I am very fortunate to speak to Mandy Andres. Mandy is a CISO. Uh, she is CISO of Elastic. And if I may say, is just one top 100 CISO of the US as well um, in the last couple of weeks. And we have just recently got to know each other um, through mutual friends and CISOs. But we've had such an interesting conversation that it became very apparent that we should record something and get something out for our community. So, Mandy, before I whittle on, would you like to share with everyone your background and how you became a CISO? And then we'll go into some of the things that we wanted to discuss today. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. As you mentioned, we had a great conversation before and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some more learnings and experiences uh, between ourselves. Uh, for myself, yes, currently CISO at Elastic, been here for six years. Prior to that, I was at a Fortune 100 financial services firm for 13 years, uh, overall 25 plus years in information security, information risk management. Uh, got into the space just through a love of tech and combination of, of tech and business and following, the, following my interests and taking those opportunities and challenges when they, when they came up and have led me here. And uh, it's always interesting to look back. And if I look back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or even when I was just coming out of, out of university, you know, the job that I have in now didn't exist. And so that's a message that I convey to my kids as well, is you never know what the future is going to hold and to be open to new opportunities. I love that. I love that. And actually, you mentioned um, six years at Elastic. That's quite a long time for a CISO. I know we spoke about that um, previously as well. What's obviously not going too much into the company detail, but as, as a role, what's held you there for that long, Mandy? It's really interesting to see. A, a couple different themes. One, just the, the journey that I've been mm. able to take with the company. So I joined pre-IPO, I went through an IPO and then you know, significant growth and scale and just a lot of interesting challenges and in, in learning and love the people that I, I work with. I have a, a fantastic team uh, and we have fun together. Uh, so that's kind of the core what keeps their day to day. Uh, but it's also there's just significant support for security as a whole from you know, CEO on down. And that is extremely helpful in, in today's world. And that security is you know, here a lot. Security is a team sport and it's a team sport, but it's also one that just requires uh, a lot of focus and a lot of support from broader business leaders. And if you don't have that, it's a significant challenge to, to be successful. But if you do have it, then you can all work together and uh, do some great things. But isn't that extraordinary that, you know, that perhaps that is not as commonplace as it should be, that, you know, a CISO doesn't necessarily have support of their own organization or the understanding of the buy-in. I mean, why do you think that is? You're fortunate you don't have that scenario and you've been able to flourish because of it. But why, Mandy? It doesn't make sense, does it? It, it, it doesn't in today's world. Um, I think, you know, historically, security was seen as just a technical issue. Uh, many times it was just a component of IT or viewed as a component of IT. And that's changed significantly in the world around us and the impact of a combination of both. Just every business runs on tech these days and you can't be successful and you can't necessarily protect your customers, whether it's information or the services that you provide. If you're not taking security seriously and because it's evolved also from just something fun and games that you know, hackers are just trying to make a name for themselves and kind of disrupt and annoy to true nation state actors, corporate yeah. espionage and very serious consequences or serious plans underlying the activities that are, that are happening. Uh, and so it's becoming a much more significant economic issue and not just a, a technical issue that uh, the hackers like to play with. Yeah, the, the, the whole narrative out there has changed, doesn't it? Especially accelerated since COVID. It's, it's, it's terrifying in many ways. Now I've written down here um, one of my favorite words, which is compounding. I love that phrase because you know, you get better the more you invest into something. And do you think so many CISOs are denying themselves that ability to really compound and make a big change? Or do you think it's the organization context or, I don't know, the challenge of, you know, after X number of years, they move on and try something different, which also gives them a fresh perspective. It's a, it's a real mix, isn't it? It is. And 
I think there's, so I feel that I've stayed in security because I like change. Hmm. Things are always changing in the security space. And you can get to, in a program, a place where you know, you're adapting and, and reacting to changes that are happening around you, but you can be in a pretty steady state. And for some folks, and I think in some security leaders, like it's a little bit boring. And the moving company to company gives new challenges, new things to learn, new problems to solve. Uh, so see, that's one of it, one piece of it. Another is, yes, the the challenge of getting business support, business buy-in and investment. And it's usually after a couple of years, you know, initially come in and, and you know, see how things are going see what your roadmap should be and start to get some support for that. Um, but then after a couple of years, you'll, you really start to see what's the true investment and focus and, and priority going to be. And that's the point where I see a lot of CISOs uh, starting to, to make decisions to, to move on to, to new companies. Because if you're, if you're there and you're either you know, fighting for that investment to do the job that you were hired to do, or uh, you know, can move on to, be more successful and not spend your days just trying to convince people to spend mm. the money and, and and invest the resources. Especially in today's world, with seemingly the the liability and the accountability of CISOs changing from uh, a more legal perspective, that's something that we all have to to think about. If we're not put in a, a position for success in our organization, and then we also need to take that into consideration as well. So there's been two, two interesting forks in the journey that we've got here now. Um, the first one I'd like to explore is tacit knowledge, you know, that wonderful accumulation of knowledge that, you know, if you stay in role and there is tenure in that role, it in some ways, doesn't that de-risk you because you know the intricacies of the organization rather than coming in somewhere fresh? And that organization benefits so much because, you know, it's embodied in the team and usually people who stay, usually have a more stable team, they stay together. They play together and, and then it just has this massive beneficial effect. And, you know, that team moving on, the drain is extraordinary, isn't it? All the stuff that's not documented and not featured, it just leaves, doesn't it? What's your thought around that? Yeah, there it creates a pretty significant disruption and uh, a, a team can adapt and, and move forward rather calmly, uh, but they could also you know, many of them leave and multiple leaders come in and I've seen both. I've seen really strong transitions and things stay very stable. And I've also seen, you know, a new security leader every year for five years after someone leaves, just because they haven't quite found the, the right fit or the right focus mm. for what that organization is looking for. So it can go either way. I would say it's a combination. It's not, you always need some turnover while not necessarily you know, consistent turnover with the leader of the team. The downside of having folks staying a while is you do get somewhat locked into that perspective and that approach and just bringing new folks into the team to bring in those new ideas and things that might be your blind spots that you don't realize. And if you're not focusing on making sure you're trying to you know, shine a light in your blind spots and find out what they are, that also uh, can create some complacency and, and put you at risk as well. That's true. I think well, the, the psychology effect is it is it something around the all around here effect, you know, that, that kind of inward looking and shaking yeah. it up can be quite cool. Now, you also touched on a very interesting area, the law. Um, and the legal side, I think it's it's fascinating to share. You went back to school and, and did a law degree in the evenings, right? Which is one. Of I few did. Things. Was it, it was commercial law, right? It was just a general law degree with a, a concentration on, on business law. Yeah. yeah. What was the trigger, Maddie, other than, you know, hell, I can do this, you know, which is kind of interesting, but... <laughs> This, this <laughs> why, why go subject yourself to four years of law school while working full time? <laughs> it was uh, so I uh, I like learning, and for myself, I, I realized structured learning is just how I operate best. Uh, and I became really fascinated with the law and its application, both applying old laws to new technology, and just the journey that I was seeing. The security space go through from 
regulations, uh, whether they're industry regulations, state in the US, different countries, and an increasing focus, and how to interpret and apply that. And so my initial interest was when I was in Silicon Valley, and I was working at some companies in California, and California in the US was the first state to pass a data breach notification law. And for some reason that triggered for me just, okay, this is probably gonna be something much bigger and really took an interest in it. And it was also, I've always enjoyed tech and business and it seemed like a, a really strong now connection of business tech and, and legal. And I like to go to school. So I went to, went to law school. And uh, a couple of fascinating things about law school for me. Uh, one, it, it really focuses on, on teaching you how, how to think and how to interpret. And so I had a, a business focus with my courses and you know, a lot of you know, how to interpret regulations, contracts, uh, and that comes in very handy in today's world in security because there's always regulations that you're looking at. Certainly there's many, many contracts that, that you're reviewing for your organization or uh, taking a look at for you know, vendors and solutions that you may, may be looking to utilize. And it's just you know, understanding what it means and what's the implications. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm not, I work very closely with the legal team in, in companies I work in and not representing any organization from a legal perspective, but it allows me to have a much more, say, or a much deeper conversation uh, because I, I understand the language and, and we can get into some of the, the specifics. And it, it does, you know, I joked when I was going into law school, you know, I, it's I always heard the joke that lawyers argue about a comma and uh, it's true. And you get very, very focused on what do words mean how are they defined if they're not defined fully in the document and what's the reasonable definition and commas can change full meanings of, of sentences and, and paragraphs and, and documents. So it's uh, really a lot of focus on being uh, precise and articulate in, in what you really mean. And for humans, uh, that's, we embed a lot of assumptions in, in what we're thinking, what we're saying, and uh, it calls out some of those assumptions or at least highlights that you're making them uh, and if you're not careful can in the end put you in a, a more challenging place. Did you find that drove your thinking perhaps slightly slower and that because of the process of going through that and therefore you thought about things in a more meaningful and deeper way rather than you know we both know CISOs who drink from the fire hose and just, you know, it's everywhere on fire every day, all day, every day. I mean, sometimes you've got to hurry up and wait, right? Slow it down and think things through. Yeah, and I think my, because I joke, I went to school for a long time. So my undergrad's in accounting, I uh, have a master's in information systems, and then I have a law degree. And having the three perspectives, uh, you know, I, I think in time as I've, you know, been in, in a role longer and longer, I, I can do it faster, but it, it gives me the perspective to take a step back and and look at it from each perspective and be able to understand or see some of the, the gotchas or pitfalls or, or, or things we need to take into consideration. I may not know all the answers, no. but I have a better idea of what questions to ask or what things to be worried about. Uh, and so kind of the accounting background I started in systems auditing so that gave me a perspective to really look at a process end to end understand the control points understand where they could break and fall down uh, the technical aspects uh, of security are there you can learn them uh, if you have an aptitude for tech uh, and probably the, the biggest journey I've been on in my career is you know I initially thought tech could solve all ills of the world and uh it can help, but that's not the case. Uh, it's really, it's people. And it's people and working with people and learning from people and, and working together. And that combination then of how can you leverage tech? How can you build processes around it? Um, that at the end of the day is what's, what leads us all. You know what you mean? I can relate to it as well because um, my degree was in psychology and business. And um, then I went into this, you know, you use... Um, 
have your university placement and I ended up in a publishing company and um, discovered this thing called Unix. So it was like, oh my Lord, this is this is the best thing I've ever <laughs> seen. I, I need to own this. And then you end up finding yourself doing these crazy, you know, seven or eight certifications, you know, in a year and reading at five o'clock in the morning on the train and just building this thirst for this project. And then along comes cybersecurity and there's your use case to apply all this. But I find that very few people that you talk to necessarily go back and learn again and I think it makes you just more plastic in your thinking and you can be malleable in that thinking and you learn how to learn. And um, I went and did um, uh, two commercial pilot licenses. I mean, the ground school for that was insane and um, flying's the easy bit. And um, it taught me so much about cybersecurity in terms of um, how you how flows can be working. And that's the process side. And how and you hear it a lot now where people talk about muscle memory and we're seeing these kind of languages coming in from aviation. In fact, yesterday I was talking to someone who used exactly cockpit type analogies. And I said, Are you a pilot? And he said, No. And I thought, this is interesting. This is seeping in now. And there's also a cultural piece about learning, which cybersecurity mm -hmm. is benefiting so much from the aviation sort of 360 um feedback. So I, I really relate to it. I don't think I ever touch law that man. Yeah, I'm not that intelligent. But um the the effect of that, though, have you found it's been very useful also in supply chain and looking at that kind of area of risk? Because that's growing as a huge discipline in its own right. And that's clearly embedded in contract and law as well, isn't it? It is. And uh, we see it from a couple different perspectives. There's all the indemnification clauses and, and warranty clauses. It, and that's not an area that I, I, I touch on. Where I focus is on the, the security addendums and what are we being asked to follow and adhere to, what are our processes, our controls, and really making sure that what we're committing to as an organization or you know, whether that's a contract with the customer or a, a certification that we're seeking to achieve, just making sure that you know, what we do is accurately reflected and vice versa, that we're not saying something that we're not doing. And just how do we make sure that the words reflect that when sometimes the words are ambiguous, if not fully defined. And so it's really honing in on those uh, potential discrepancies and making sure that you're you're seeing them and catching them and, and uh, reflecting reality. Ah, that was my next question. Security addendums. How much trust do you place in these sort of you know, the DPAs and addendums and other kind of compliance cycles here? Because, you know, ultimately, if you're accepting something into supply chain, you as, you as a CISO have made a, a risk decision or your team has with others. Um, do you trust these certifications you see, like software certifications, for example? I can't be specific on a in a discussion, but uh, you know what I'm referring to. And um, um and people's assertions of whether they really are compliant to certain things. I think I was just talking about this uh, actually earlier this week. There's when kind of the common certifications were were created. It was it was years ago, and and the world was a little bit different than than it is today. And so I think what's happened the the gap between what. The, the common certifications are looking at and the reality of what creates a secure environment today are, are very, very different. And I've, I've seen the evolution uh, even in you know, what folks look for to where before you had the common certifications, that was great, you're good. And that often bypassed more aspects of a third party risk or supply chain process. Uh, and that's not happening today. That Today, that's the bare minimum to get into the conversation, having those base certifications, and then the focus on how are you actually trying to protect and defend against common threats and, and attacks today. And you know, as, we're, as we're moving very quickly, uh, more and more complex, expanding more and more into cloud. Now we have all the, the AI conversations and starting to see you know, those questions coming in. And it, it just, it gets bigger and bigger and, and bigger. So I don't, I don't think it's about Especially that the contracts and the addendums and even the certifications promise or 
you know, say that you're going to you know not have a, an event i think it, it, everyone in today's world will have multiple events it's more focused on at least understanding are you doing the the basics do you have the core things in place do you even pay attention do you have a program and just understanding that there's a focus there and uh, it, it's a space that, that i think is really ripe for change because it's it's very time consuming. It's very cumbersome. It's not always a true value add to the the relationship or, or the partnership. Uh, but it's something that we've tried to solve as an industry for many years. Uh, you know, we, we had it all all the security contracts, which uh, in the U.S. the state of Massachusetts uh, was the one that really started the security addendum requirements, and it really, really just ballooned from there. And then we had the at least in financial services, the creation of the SIG, trying to then create a common questionnaire, which worked for a little while. And then everyone started to add their own sections and, and bespoke things. And it, it's, so now that's taken on a life of its own. So now we're trying to solve the questionnaire issue. But at the, the core of it, everyone's just trying to understand, you know, what what is your security posture? What is your security program? And, you know, I've talked a lot recently and heard a lot of analogies of just the security world and the CISO role kind of being the same place that the CFO role was in, you know, pre, pre Enron, pre Sarbanes Oxley in the, in the US from a uh, controls and, and reporting perspective. And then with my accounting background, I take it back to, you know, there's gap in the US generally accepted accounting principles and Everyone follows that. So you know they're following the same rules when they're reporting out their financial statements. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think in time, the security world will do something similar. Just what is that language? So we, we can take different approaches. We can have different priorities in our programs. But how do we, in a very common way, communicate what, that, you know, what the results are? Uh, and I would love to see something like that happen. I have no idea what it would look like, but I, I think we, we need something like that. Uh, just to really be able to focus on the right things from a security spec perspective in today's world. It's asking the right questions and very commonly we see these audits and um, you know they come to us as if you know we're a SaaS provider, we're not. It's very interesting. So you know, NA, DSCOPE, you know, and you know, it's a fascinating world that you have to go through. And um interesting the other day, we always put the comment in there, which is, you know, you are more than welcome to see and audit this process. We're proud of it. Put a lot of work in fact we spent a year beforehand before we launched the business doing all this stuff knowing that this is going to come up from day one if, if you do it properly and um really the other day someone actually took us up on it and it was great because we could actually show yeah here it is and here is the maturity and this is how many years it's been going these are all the changes and things like that so it, it, it's a good thing but that transparency seems to be somewhat opaque still um but it goes back to another thing which i Remember when we spoke last, you talked about fundamentals in cybersecurity, and um, it's it's it, that really stuck in my head, Mandy. Um, and it's a bit like the yellow car syndrome, right? You don't see any yellow cars until you then tune into the yellow car. Then they're everywhere, right? I've suddenly picked up on this word fundamentals, um, and I'm starting to hear it more. Maybe I'm leading with it. I don't know, but it is something that people get so obsessed with them, or so brought along the journey of complexity that perhaps the fundamentals get lost. So what do you, what's your view in cybersecurity about fundamentals? I know that you said that the um, fundamentals are boring, which is often why they get um, missed, which I thought was just so cool. But, you know, tell me more. Yeah, that's the, it's not the fun, new, shiny thing to, to work on. You know, just make sure configurations, but they should be you know, disabled all the default accounts, change the passwords, whatever the, the specifics are for the, the thing that you're looking at in that that's just that is the real boring stuff everyone likes the new shiny tech the new shiny objects and, and playing and, and learning new things uh, the reality is you know i'd heard before like 85 plus percent of you know, security events would be stopped with good security hygiene and uh, i was at a event a couple of weeks ago and they presented that nearly 98 percent of security events would be unable to be achieved if folks just followed strong security hygiene. Mm -hmm. And it's, in, in some cases, it's 
because it's it's boring and, and folks want to focus on different things. But it's also uh, on the flip side the inability or lack of desire for change on on the technical side, and so changing has the potential to create issues, create downtime, create availability issues. And so it's that balance of, uh, and, and with that, I see a lot of security. And, and when we talk about, we have a lot of tools, a lot of it is just working around the fact that we can't make changes where we should, or we can't change things because you know we have a, a really old system, a really old application running on a really old operating system that we're not gonna do anything about. and. We know it's a risk and I know that gets into all of the risk-based decisions and risk appetites and things like that. So we have to you know, do compensating controls around things like that, uh, which adds, adds to the complexity as well. So the tools as a band-aid? Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Some would say it's a compensating control. Other people find it very convenient as a band-aid to replace the need to do the fundamentals, right? Very true. Interesting. But I don't think the fundamentals are boring at all. I think it's uh, there's a sense of satisfaction when you do things well and cleanly and execute, you know, just so. And then, you know, use sensible and common practices, you know, your risk register and such to say there are some things that are commercially not viable to, you know, go and do, or we have not got the resources or the budget, whatever, to tackle them all the time. Um, Actually, I do remember us speaking about another thing. You've often said it isn't always cash that's the consideration, it's the time. It's not the funding for something, it's the time to implement or the skills to implement. Tell me a bit more around that thing, thinking, Mandy. It's kind of interesting. Sure. So when I think we often fall into the trap, and I've, I've done it myself, of uh, bringing in this tool and it's going to solve this issue. And it has the ability to solve that issue, yes. But what we often don't then spend the time on is what does that mean in our environment? How do we make it work in our environment? How do we think ahead of time of, okay, we're going to get this tool. What do we need to change? What do we need to create to be able to leverage the capabilities of, of the tool and, and be able to take advantage of all of its capabilities? And, you know, a lot of times there's, you know, the, the out, you bring a new tool in, uh, first there's the, the whole process to, to bring it in and be sometimes realistic about what your internal processes are to get there. But then once you get something in, it's the deployment, uh, but then post-deployment, it's how do you maintain and maintain both the tool itself, but also maintain what's the output of the new processes that came in. So if it's something that's to find gaps of something in your environment, you need to go in focusing on well, what is your process going to be to analyze and mitigate whatever your decisions are for those gaps that the, the tool identifies. I uh, think we, we often, from a security perspective, we stop on the tool implementation and not on then, okay, what's what do we do with all the stuff that we learned coming out of it? And how are we going to approach that? The one thing I, one, one of the things I love about doing these discussions um, is you know, you've learned so much yourself and you just said something really interesting. I have not actually heard in my career anyone say, we've implemented a tool, what did we learn? I mean, I've seen it, but I've never heard anyone say that ever. And I guess you and I have been around in this industry for roughly the same time. So why is that? Why do people not talk about what they've learned around tooling and the implementation and their post follow-up, if you like? That's a good question. I, I think it's, I think it's implied a lot. I think the learnings are there. It's just not talked about in the specific way of going, this is what I learned. It's a lot of taking what you learned and you know going into the next effort and say, well, it, it may be not even consciously going, you know, well, mm -hmm. I had this pain or this trouble in this last go around. So we're, we're gonna take this approach and transferring that experience and sometimes not even realizing the direct connection that is making that that comment or that, that consideration. Interesting. 
relatively recently, I mean, yeah, as you say, it's implicit, but we've implemented um, an interesting process inside, which is like, what did we learn? Actually taking the time to stop, slow down and say, what did we learn here? And it's amazing because, you know, when you, you've learned something, but you're not necessarily, you haven't been able to articulate it. And then there are other things when you start to articulate, other things come out and oddly it triggers more learning as well. <laughs> Very interesting. And I'd like to call something out. You, you've said it just now, which I think is, I, I read, I take my hat off to you, Andy. You said I fall into that trap. I wrote, wrote in my pad here, trap equals error, right? Why why do people fear about speaking about errors when errors are your best method of learning? It's a universal constant in human beings, right? We get better by erroring. And if our error rate's higher, we learn better and quicker, right? Is that a cybersecurity thing? Is it a pride thing? What is it? And that, it's not just cybersecurity. I mean, ultimately it goes down to fear and people mm -hmm. have jobs to support their family, support their, you know, provide the livelihood that they need. And so it embeds a, just a base amount of fear of, well, how do I, how do I need to operate to, you know, essentially not, not lose my job and be able to continue to sustain my livelihood and, and support my family. And, and that leads to, many different decisions, actions that in hindsight were probably not the, the right ones or, or more negative leading. Seemingly to you were doing the right thing, sometimes doing the wrong thing for the right reasons or the right thing for the wrong reasons. And definitely not just the security components. And I think that back to, you know, you focused on psychology. I think it, it's human, human nature and uh, I joke if I if I went to study something else, it would be the behavioral sciences uh, in today's oh, yeah. world and security. That would be a, uh, something really, really interesting to learn more about. Well, that's very interesting you say that because um, you know, we've all, I don't like the term because it becomes, I don't know, cliche, I don't know, it's the wrong word, fishing, right? But, you know, there was some studies obviously just come out that shows, you know, our, our, our errors are in our tooling and our detection and our response and our errors are in our human beings and you know human beings do do things which sometimes can be questioned or maybe a bit wacky or wild sometimes you sit there and say you know that really didn't involve common sense but then you know looking at it from another perspective the bad actors are sitting there playing on exactly the last two minutes of our conversation it's a wonderful thing so our own orgs we have to protect ourselves because our essentially our house, our mortgages, et cetera, are all based on it. Hackers don't have that rule. Bad actors certainly don't have those rules. And so they could prey on the fact that people do do things and they cover them up or, you know, too busy or, or whatever. Where's your mind take you now into the sort of social engineering, human engineering, behavioral sciences now you've mentioned it? Because it's such a vastly growing area very, very quickly. Yeah, I, I go back to you know, the initial focus of, of security as a as a tech problem, and I think for a long time, again myself included in the industry, we tried to solve everything with with tech. And if you take a few steps back and look at a macro level, things like phishing and all of the related types of activities, I mean, they're they're social engineering, and social engineering is essentially a, you know a con it's preying on human behavior human nature and yes technology can help but it can't prevent and everyone is susceptible even mm -hmm. the the most focused person there's things that will trigger you to be anxious and concerned there's catching you when you are stressed about something and not paying as close attention there's ways to catch everyone and uh, i see it yeah you know, I, I, what I like is that we're talking more about security from the human behavior and instead of trying to force humans to change their behavior, which is ingrained in many thousands of years, and that's not going to work. It's we're finally focusing as an industry on how to work with human nature and human behavior. So I think that's phenomenal. But I also think it's not it's not just an issue for security to solve because you know, social, social engineering has existed forever. It just takes different forms on what folks are, are focusing on. And right now it just happens, happens to work very well through some tech mechanisms. And, and you know, I think it'll, it'll be getting 
much easier and harder to detect. You know, we already talked about AI uh, just as all the deep fakes and things come up. I think that'll make it worse in the, in the near term until we figure that out. But uh, the one thing that I have learned uh, in all my years in security about threat actors is they are very smart, very creative, and will, will go ways you don't necessarily expect if they think they'll, they'll be able to achieve their, their goal, whether that's making money or gaining access to, to information. And so it's, if there's a desire, uh, there's always a way. Nice. And that's the, also the reward of working in this industry, isn't it? It's that constant challenge. And so looking forward, Mandy, where does your, in the next, just closing couple of minutes here, where does your mind now take you other than a degree or a PhD in behavioral science? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's, I mean, I think we're in a space where for many years that the speed of change is increasing. And I think it just continues to increase and it continues to get faster and faster. And I don't think we know how to keep up. And it was in some conversations recently where there's, you know, historically a lot of talk about resilience. You know, how do you bounce back? How, how do you make sure that you're prepared? And starting to hear the conversation move into uh, anti-fragility. And so I've been looking at and really understanding, you know, what does anti-fragility means and where resilience means something happens and you're able to recover quickly. Anti-fragility is how do you not truly be impacted and you're able to grow and be better. It, it, it's essentially, you know, embracing the chaos and being able to succeed and thrive in that world where I think today we spend a lot of time trying to contain and control the chaos. Uh, and when we talk about speed of change, technical evolution, I, I think what we're really meaning is there's just so much happening. We can't get our arms around it. We, just, we can't know everything. And mm -hmm. all of our the practices historically were based on, well, we need to know what's going on in our environment. And I, I don't think that's a reality today. It's very, very hard to know what is your entire environment, uh, not just shadow IT types of things and exploding cloud services, but you have, we mentioned supply chain, you have a, a, a very significant reliance on partners, whether that's third-party services, applications, other companies. And, you know, we see things in the world happening today that a lot of there's just unknown connections and unknown reactions that can happen you know, in the U.S. specifically, you know, we had one event at a healthcare company that brought the a large portion of the U.S. healthcare system to stop for a while or be unable to, to process. And I don't, I don't think anyone anticipated that that would be the result of something like that, you know, event at that one organization. And I think it's how do we operate in a world where things are going to happen and we don't and can't necessarily anticipate all of the consequences. And just what do we need to change from our mindset, from our practices? How do, how do we do that? So kind of some of the things I'm focusing on, I think in the in the near term, continuing those conversations. That's one I'd love to explore with you another time, but embracing the chaos, maybe that's the antidote to CISO burnout and stress that, you know, we change our mindset and, uh, and shift. Maybe it needs more thought, doesn't it? There's a lot to it. An awful yeah, absolutely lot. we certainly can't put it in a box and lock that box anymore that's for sure mandy what a fascinating conversation as always um really really interesting and um something i really look forward to seeing the write-up on as well but for the moment mandy andres CISO of elastic thank you very very much indeed thank you for having me enjoyed it